Καλησπέρα σε όλους και καλή εβδομάδα. I'll switch into English to honor our guests and the two speakers that we have in our panel today. Let me allow and introduce myself first of all. My name is Dimitris Kutsopoulos and I'm the CEO of Deloitte in Greece. And the matter that we will be discussing through our panel is the future of learning. Undoubtedly, human capital is more important than ever and constitutes the primary factor in sustaining competitive advantage over time for all companies. Organizations are evaluating their main goal for further enhancing their employees through building a solid business learning environment. The most important responsibility of the learning and development team is to manage people's development in a way that supports key business priorities. For this reason, they ought to cultivate a continuous learning culture, recognizing the importance of upskilling and reskilling, and that the relationship between learning and work is evolving in a fast pace. <clears throat> But lately, hard questions require solid answers concerning the aim of their work-based learning and how they can best achieve the results that are most beneficial to the employee and the company. Allow me to introduce our two distinguished global leaders. First, we have Leven de Groot. Leven is the global learning and Deloitte University leader of Deloitte. He's responsible for the development and implementation of both the global learning and development strategy and the global Deloitte University strategy at Deloitte. Deloitte's vision is to grow leaders for the future, build world-class capabilities for maximum client impact, and consistently deliver an exceptional development experience to its people. The six Deloitte universities across the globe provide a unique development experience where Deloitte grows the world's best leaders, inspires lasting connections, and drives towards undisputed leadership. And then I would also like to introduce Vasily Bertoen. Vasily is the managing partner of the Deloitte Center for the Edge at EMEA. Previously, he was the founder and managing director of Deloitte Innovation in the Netherlands, a successful incubator. Vasily has more than 15 years of experience in innovation, and his focus and passion is to activate organizations to unlock their full innovation potential. His expertise is making organizations and individuals aware of the new opportunities on the edge and help them profit from them. Vasily has been leading strategic innovation transformations at board level at many corporates in different industries. He's also the co-founder of Amstel Dialogues, a peer-to-peer -peer CEO dialogue platform in which they share their most urgent personal leadership dilemmas around the transformation of their companies. We are honored to have Vasily with us for the second time, having discussed last year about the future of innovation in innovation districts and now about the future of learning. So if you allow me, I'll start with the skills that build the employee of the future. According to World Economics Forum Future of Jobs report of 2020, employers expect that by 2025, the percentage of jobs that are no longer relevant or could be replaced by automation will decline from 15.4% of the global workforce to 9%. And that currently emerging professions will grow from 7.8% to 13.5% of the total employee base over the same period. <coughs> In the majority of business sectors, companies consider the ever-increasing skills gap as the major barrier to adopting new technologies that could increase productivity. So I will start with a question to Vasily. How can we determine the value of skills relevant to the future of work marketplace and which skills and capabilities are the most critical going forward, offering a true competitive advantage? Thank you, Dimitris. Am I loud and clear? Still, great. And it's always a pleasure to be with you as, because also my name is originating from your country, of course, and you're doing great things at the moment in Thessaloniki. So uh, it's a honor and pleasure to be with you. Um, my answer to your question on the skill side is, I would summarize it in curiosity. If you have the curiosity, because we sometimes think if uh, the skill set should be maybe around digital, for example. And we think it's complicated and when you are not grown up with digital, it might be difficult, etc. I doubt it. Of course, the, the hard artificial intelligence, etc., the deep uh, deep learning is, is quite of, uh, challenging. But many digital skills can be learned if you're curious. And I would like to give three examples. Uh, curiosity can be and three elements of curiosity. One is 
the passion of the explorer, as we call it in the center for the edge. We know that the people that will learn fastest and are helping their organizations to, to keep up in the speed of these times have the passion of the explorer. What is it? And we did that for thousands of employees and around 16% of those employees has it, but you can help to let it grow that number. And what is passion of explorer is that you have a commitment to a domain, for example, energy sector or education or anything. You should have some anchor. The second thing is that then on that anchor, on that basis, it doesn't have to be digital or the, the new skill you have to learn. It should be an anchor that's relevant to the job. And then you can learn new skills if you do two things. One is if you don't, when you are confronted with something difficult, you don't go back into your room and try to solve it yourself, but you go out there and connect to outside, to your colleagues or outside your organization and really have to explore a mindset to start exploring and not try to solve it yourself. And the second way is not solving yourself is asking questions. So learn to ask questions. That sounds vulnerable because you show you maybe don't know something. But in this new world, when our kids do games, when my boys at home are playing online games, they ask each other all the time questions in the chat box. How do I solve this? There is a barrier. Can you have, do you have a tool for that? That we should learn. That asking questions is a source of strength and not of vulnerability or weakness. Um, and then that comes, the same is then you collaborate. So it is the open mindset and, and having a collaborative mindset. If you collaborate, you can build on each other's skills and together. And the good news about digital is that it's much easier to combine stuff and to quickly interact than writing a report on your own in your, in your cellar. The last topic I want to, um, point I want to make is inclusion. If we are able to unlock the full potential of inclusion, and I mean, for example, autism, I discovered that one of the best team members I had that went to Philips afterwards had, was um, diagnosed with autism. And of course, there's not yes or no autism. There's a scale, but he had that skill on it. And he, many years later, he explained, but he was really great in some st stuff and was indeed less uh, great in connecting and if we want to make sometimes we try to make everybody average you have to fit in one basket but if we are really inclusive and open-minded uh, on, on what people can bring then we unlock those skills and those people are and i generalize of course those people but people that have different capabilities and if we're really inclusive we don't try to fit them in the same box we might have a lot of joy and uh, success together. So those are my three topics. Passion of the explorer, collaborate, open mindset for collaborate, and inclusion, and it summarizes with curiosity. Thank you very, very much, Vasily. So a question for Levin. As Deloitte's global learning leader, could you tell us how Deloitte is trying to tackle the skills gap? How do you ensure that Deloitte's biggest asset, its people remain constantly skillful amidst the ever-changing business needs leading Deloitte into the future? Yeah, thank you, uh, Dimitris, and um, very honored, my pleasure to be here uh, with, with, with you today. Well, if, if you think about Deloitte, uh, Deloitte is first of all a client service organization. So our focus on skills, uh, the hot skills as we define them uh, right now, are, are those types of skills that our client, clients need. And so we're focused as an organization on developing the skills in cyber, artificial intelligence, cloud, and we need to develop those. And these are just a, 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 a examples of the hot skills that are out there and the needs that are out there. And um, so we, we need to make sure that we develop our own employees in those skills areas in order to serve our clients. And uh, we do that obviously by developing them. And we're setting up alliances with vendors, with universities, uh, depending on the skills area to rapidly develop those skills with our professionals. And so we develop them, uh, but also we try to hire for those skills. Um, but even then we find out that we cannot fulfill that need fast enough. So that's where uh, the reskilling, upskilling of our professional uh, comes into play. And we even go that far 
uh, to the point of Vasily of looking broader than our classic uh, pool of talent. We even go so far to set up, we call it hire to train programs, where the training is an integral part of the offer, the proposal that we put out to that prospective uh, employee. And they start immediately with an intensive training. And there are some gates uh, where they need to pass in order to uh, secure the employment. Uh, so that's around business skills, uh, the technology skills, I would say, as I mentioned, cloud AI, sustainability, climate. Uh, those are those uh, big skills area in demand. Uh, obviously, the other set is uh, the set of uh, the human skills or the leadership skills that we develop with our people. Curiosity is a beautiful example that um, uh, Wazili has pointed out here. And there, a big shift has, uh, has happened over the last years with COVID-19, um, where we uh, need to develop our people in leading leadership skills, collaboration skills, in working in a hybrid context, in a virtual context. Um, and so that's another uh, area of uh, priority for us uh, to develop our people both in the leadership component as in the technical uh, business component. Thank you very much, Lisa. To take it a little bit uh, forward, and according to many reports, half of all employees worldwide will need to be reskilled by 2025. And that's not including those out of employment, let alone the famous quote that 85% of all jobs in 2030 have not been invented yet. Thus, organizations and societies ought to focus on building strong culture of continuous learning in order to build a successful business of the future. The more leaders talk about the importance of skill development, including what skills th themselves are developing, the more they build strong culture of continuous learning. So a question to Vasily again, what are the optimal models that organizations and other stakeholders have to invent and or adopt in order to promote continuous learning and lifelong learning pathways? Yeah, uh, uh, good question. And, and what I would say is that, that um, the opposite of curiosity is fear. An opposite. There can be other opposites, but an opposite of... Uh, if you have a lot of fear, you're, you tend to close your mind um, and close your focus. So how do we overcome fear? The journey beyond fear, we call that. And that's about how can we really help to be open for learning and to, to, to do learn new things or to get new jobs. As, as Lieven explained, that they take those jobs, that they get training on the job. But they have to trust that you really can develop yourself. Otherwise, you're out of work in half a year again. So how do... And what we believe is that... And I believe is that a model is that an organization does at, at least two things. One is creating a narrative of trust that you really have a direction where you go and you want to follow. There is a, a future perspective that is so appealing. You want to be, we call it sometimes also purpose, huh? but uh, to have a purpose, you have to have a narrative and, and it's a narrative is an open-ended story is in the direction, but you, I need you. If I tell the narrative, I need you to join me to together get there. So we find out together how to get there. That's the first statement. If companies do that or organizations do that, it sounds like, okay, they haven't solved it themselves. I can help. And then you get more trust that there is a direction. And it's also authentic because we don't know everything yet. Second thing is that um, we have so much focused on efficiency the last decades or even century. All our um, mechanical and post-industrial and industrial models, we are based on industrial models. Those are focused on efficiency. For efficiency is pushing assets as efficient as possible into the market and making uh, money. Now, the learning mindset is much more pool-based. Seeing what I like, Levin said, we are client-focused uh, organization, of course, client -centered. So what do they really need? And are you agile enough to respond to that and to uh, reorganize yourself all the time? Uh, pooling assets or pooling resources from wherever, from the world, from different sources, from Deloitte inside, in the, if it's our organization, but also from ecosystems. So if you are more uh, agile and open-minded to work in ecosystems, and it can be your internal ecosystems or your external ecosystems, you can learn faster and change faster. 
So the two things I would say, the models are in the journey beyond fear that people have to trust to develop themselves and the organization have to trust to change is a narrative, uh, creating perspective. And second, apply focus on learning in instead of uh, scalable learning instead of scalable efficiency. And then we should reward it as well in the year ends and where everybody reward when you have, uh, have the learning uh, focus instead of the efficiency focus only. And of course, we have to make money, but you have to balance that. Thank you, Vasily. And a question to Lieben. How does Deloitte establish a culture of continuous learning? Yeah, at, 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 at Deloitte, I see we only have people at Deloitte. Eh? That that is, uh, those are our products. Uh, those are uh, people are delivering services at at our clients. So so we believe uh, that at Deloitte we're always learning. Our people are always learning, uh, no matter what they are doing. If they're serving clients on engagements, if they're working on internal projects with colleagues if they're uh, developing proposals or writing a paper. Um, our, our philosophy is that everybody is always learning. And, um, and actually that has been confirmed if we, we did a big voice of the customer, an internal research with our professionals uh, a year ago when developing our strategy. And when we asked our people, what are the most impactful development experiences uh, for you personally? Uh, the top two was on the first place, it was uh, learning on interesting engagement at clients uh, day to day. And the second one, uh, learning through coaching and mentoring. So this was not uh, going to a training program, attending a seminar, but it was learning on the job and learning from more experienced colleagues. So hence that confirms the idea of uh, always learning and getting having that continuous uh, learning culture. And one of the techniques that we apply to uh, cement that uh, culture is that each of our professional has a coach, has a counselor who is a more experienced uh, colleague who has been uh, in their shoes uh, for a number of years and who can advise, coach them on a continuous basis. So that's the way how we establish that culture. Obviously, this has been challenged uh, moving into COVID where everything turned virtual. Uh, so this had be this coaching and on the job development had been had, had to be organized uh, in a more structured way. Uh, through frequent check-in points, uh, while previously people were together uh, in a meeting room or at a client and where this would happen uh, naturally. Uh, but this, these, are, these are ways how we embed a continuous learning culture uh, in our uh, organization. Thank you, Lieben. COVID-19 has accelerated the need to implement an ambiguous global upskilling agenda because it is forcing digitalization and automation at a more rapid pace. For this reason, it's expected that organizations should join the learning and development revolution in order to thrive post-pandemic, the post I open and close quotation marks because of what we currently face today, and also be prepared for future pandemics. Moreover, the shift to a digital knowledge-based economy shows that a vibrant workforce is more important than ever. So, Vasily, how has COVID-19, together with digitalization and automation, changed the way we learn? What are the greatest risks and how we can overcome them? What have we learned? Yeah, so I, I think that, that um, first of all, what we have learned, the organizations that were not digitally ready could not work in the cloud. Uh, had a shock. So they learned that digital was and is important. That's one. When you were digital, for example, at Deloitte, we also had the same shock, but we are not having that cloud shock because we could turn our business in one day and it, and it surprised ourselves. In one day, literally in one day, we went a different a little bit per geo, had a day of closing the, the, the country, of course, but we went uh, in, into the cloud and virtually working one day. What happened is we were expecting problems but of course in many businesses we it went on eh? if you were not in uh, in uh, leisure etc and uh, we even were more efficient so what we learned is when the urgency is high when you really need to go 
uh, virtually and digital, you can, if you have the infrastructure. And um, so it's less scary than people thought. It's more fun than people thought. It works better than people thought because you can do a lot and even more. So we had to slow down the people because we were having so many meetings a day that people uh, got uh, exhausted. So we turned that down. We, we changed that. But we also learned the limitations of virtual and digital, of course. So at the end, what we learned is a rapid digital course uh, of the, the pros and cons um, and also less fear. So it was a, 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 a mass experiment and that helped to, to exceed, accelerate the speed of digital. What we now have to do and what we learned also is that it went so much focus on efficiency that creativity, real connection, uh, visions, etc., were limited. So you really need also other connections or solve it in a virtual better way. So what we need to do now is don't wait for the next pandemic or wait for the next moment and just fall back or do some half hybrid meetings. No, find the real great tools to, to take that combination of hybrid to the next level. Because it can be a pandemic, it can be a war, but it can also be simply global business because we suddenly could have a speaker uh, like the today, five years ago, you would not have accepted this. I had to be physically with you or I would not have been part of this meeting. And now we can exchange inspiration and ideas in this way, in a hybrid way. So that we see the benefit, but we should now optimize these uh, tools and, and, and ways of working and our mindset that we are, we are more flexible in this. Um, I truly appreciate that and I very much agree. However, for next year, I would appreciate if you can be in person with us. <laughs> I will do my best. Took the opportunity to. So for Levin, how has COVID-19 impacted learning at Deloitte? And what are the lessons learned for the future? Yeah, very uh, similar to what Silly uh, said. We basically changed overnight and, and, and luckily we had the, the technology to support it. Um, but we, we very much came from a, uh, typically learning was a live in-person program uh, where people went to a hotel or to a Deloitte University to attend it. Um, and that, so that changed overnight. And so we, uh, as an organization, we, we call it, we virtualized all our learning uh, offers uh, for our professionals in order to continue to develop our uh, professionals. Now, um, what have we learned? Well, first thing that we've learned is we've learned to, uh, to look in detail to our learning and development offering and, and be very purposeful to uh, how we deliver uh, that development. And so there is, if it's purely knowledge and information sharing, you can perfectly do that uh, in a digital way. Uh, you don't need to organize live in-person events for it. But there are there is uh, learning uh, and development that is better done live in person uh, when it comes or, uh, when it's about experience sharing, role playing, skill building, um, how to learn coaching, for example, or how to build relationship with clients. This this skill building is better done in an in-person format. So um, that's one of the learnings that we did is to be very clear uh, and deliberate about this is the type of uh, knowledge that we, um, that, that we learn in a digital way. And this is something that we do virtually um, with virtual facilitation. And a third set of uh, skill building is that we better do uh, in person. Another Maybe learning is that this, because I'm, I'm your customer as well on this, huh? yeah. I'm also doing, and I must give you a compliment. We have uh, normally it was like you have to do those e, uh, e learnings, and now I'm nearly looking forward to the next one. Of course, for example, the sustainability learning was really inspirational. So you see the improvement, it's really interesting to see because years before it was more like a have to. Uh, yeah. That's interesting yeah. to see. So thanks. Yeah, no, thank you. And, and that's indeed an additional element is. And that's our next challenge. We need now to bring that quality of digital learning up to a level as we had with our live in-person learnings. And, um, and so we're, we're on our way there, but there's still uh, room for improvement. Another lesson learned is um, 
Yeah, everything becomes much more personalized and individualized with, with access to learning experience platform, all those digital assets. We saw much more of a pool uh, of our professionals than the typical large programs where you pull and yeah, one size fits all. Everybody needs to go through the same thing. It is now not much more individualized, even to the degree that we are building in assessments now uh, in digital programs where people just can skip a few levels. If they're successfully passed an assessment, then they don't need to go through all learning um, with, with, with all uh, colleagues. And, and last, to your point, Dimitris, of the importance of being uh, in person there, and, and that absolutely remains um, very important. Uh, we've, uh, we've experienced that as well coming out of COVID. And uh, you refer to the Deloitte University. We, we have indeed six Deloitte universities, uh, one in Brussels, and soon one in Paris in Europe. And then we have uh, one in, in, in Dallas in the US, in Toronto, in Mexico. Uh, we have one in Singapore and in Hyderabad. And those are physical buildings where two, 300, 500, 800 colleagues of Deloitte come together uh, during a couple of days um, to, uh, to participate in leadership development, to learn from a more experienced leaders. And we found that connection is really critical um, for our people. And I'll give you one example. Um, in, in, uh, if I look to the US facility, uh, there were 15,000 new people hired during the pandemic uh, in the US organization um, and who had never seen uh, any of their colleagues. And the first time they went after uh, the pandemic, they went to a Deloitte University onboarding program. The folks who went through that program uh, six months after, they are still, 100% is still with Deloitte. The folks who, um, who we hired during pandemic and who did not go to a program, we have a much higher turnover rate there. So you see the direct impact of uh, importance of in-person uh, connections uh, in your learning culture and as an organization. Thank you, Levin. Nowadays, many prominent companies, especially those technology leaders such as Google's and Apple and Amazon's of the world, apart from embracing solid upskilling and reskilling strategies, are also keen to hire employees who have the skills required to get the jobs done, with or without a degree. So very quickly for, for Wasili, do you believe that organizations could become learning hubs by taking advantage of collective intelligence to solve real life problems in order to be able to deliver collaborative learning, building the role of non-formal and informal learning. Yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, we should do that. Uh, that's also part of inclusion, not thinking in those boxes. And I, there are two things I would say is important. One purpose, give them direction, give them that the, the narrative and the, the, the direction they have to go, because that's still the guideline. And second thing, what we lear, learn from agile organization, of course, is the short cycles short sprints because then you can learn faster you have milestones and results in a few weeks for example but also when something doesn't go well you can redirect and improve and then it's a mistake it's not a big problem if you wait half a year a mistake becomes a big mistake and a lot of uh, lose of face but if you uh, have short cycles uh, it's just part of the job so that will be my uh, absolutely but then please apply those two thank you and Levin, what's the stance of Deloitte regarding this specific trend? Will service of any organization such as us still trust business degrees or they will gradually start deploying their own micro-credentials, let's put it like that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, we, we have a very diverse uh, business at Deloitte and so uh, uh, part of our business is, is regulated uh, and so uh, degrees and, and certifications will always remain uh, essential, uh, very important and essential, actually, uh, for, for those businesses. Um, but at the same time, I, also we see in different pockets of our advisory businesses that we're indeed recruiting from a more diverse uh, pool, not a standard um, business economics uh, degrees, uh, but we even hire people with a certain certification in a specific technology. 
um, because that's the skill that, that we are looking for. And then we're counting on our internal development programs to, um, yeah, to provide other skill development um, besides that. And the Hire to Train program is one example that I mentioned um, in, in the previous section of, um, of how you broaden that, uh, yeah, that talent uh, pool. Uh, in terms of credentialing, uh, absolutely, uh, that is uh, high on our agenda. And we're looking to different set of credentialing, both in technology, but also in, uh, let's say, the power skills or leadership skills area, like coaching, like, like facilitation. Um, those are also important to provide credentialing as a recognition for the skills that our people um, acquire, but also as an assurance uh, for our clients in terms of skills that they get offered uh, to work for them. And there it's important that credentialing is really meaty and that it's not about following a course, but it's also about um, having had the experience, uh, eminence, uh, interventions, uh, that those all become part of a, a full credential so that that credentialing is also meaningful. Thank you, Levin. Uh, we have been given 30 minutes and it has gone by very, very quickly. We have addressed the future of learning and just for the sake of all, I'll just need to refer to six words that have been discussed throughout. Curiosity, purpose, connection, collaboration, inclusion and diversity. I believe, I truly believe that all these capture what the future of learning should be. And I would really want to thank both Vasily and Levin, Levin and Vasily for the participation in this panel. And I'm certain that people attending uh, our forum has uh, have got a lot of added value by participating in this. Thank you both very, very much. My, My pleasure. pleasure. Yeah.